you, Sandra. You're welcome. Again, not the easiest of scriptures, and a couple of names in there. Uh, Philemon is the letter name, uh, the person to whom Paul was writing, Philemon, and uh, Onesimus is the name of the uh, slave person that he was writing about. Okay, thank you for that. I have a question for you, as I try to do on a Sunday morning. Do the names John Newton and or William Wilberforce ring any bells for you? John Newton, William Wilberforce? Yes, yes, exactly. Amazing Grace. Now, John Newton is the, uh, the, the former slave trader, European slave trader from, uh, from England who, who uh, became a Christian and then for the rest of his life he lived in despair and guilt really over the life that he had led and wrote dozens of famous hymns but this Amazing Grace is the most famous of, of his hymns. And then William Wilberforce was a contemporary of John Newton. They knew each other from childhood and uh, John Newton was somewhat of a mentor to him and encouraged William Wilberforce to stay in politics when he was trying, to, he wanted to go into the ministry. Newton said, no, you're much better in politics. You can see the abolition of the slave trade much better in politics. And so William Wilberforce stayed in politics in British Parliament uh, until the end of his career, and he indeed did in the very last days he saw the abolition of the European slave trade. And this is what he said about the slave trade. So enormous, so dreadful, so irredeemable that its wickedness appeared that my own mind was completely made up for abolition. William Wilberforce might have had today's passage in mind as the Apostle Paul requests that Philemon abolish the slave trade in his own life for the sake of Christ. This short letter written by Paul from Rome, from a Roman prison, to a Christian brother, Philemon, and his wife, Apia. She's in there too from the beginning of the letter. This letter resonates throughout all of history and even till today. Onesimus was this this slave that had escaped, he was a, he was a fugitive slave, uh, owned previously by Philemon. Paul met him in Rome, and Onesimus must have become a Christian under Paul's evangelism there in Rome. And he wrote this letter, Paul did, to Philemon and to his wife to appeal to their good Christian nature, and that when the when Onesimus would return to him, that he would not return as a slave or a servant. And not only that, but he would come back without any retribution for the uh, crimes that he had committed. And as a matter of fact, Paul goes another step, which is amazing. He suggests that Philemon receive back Onesimus as, a, as not a slave or a servant, but as a brother in Christ, a partner in ministry. Paul describes Onesimus like this, and just imagine the revolutionary nature of his words, that Onesimus is my son. That came from today's reading. Paul called him my very heart. Paul said, he is very dear to me as a fellow man and also as a brother in the Lord, a partner in Christ. It's incredible. It means that Onesimus had equal rights. That's a phrase we know about today. As if you were family, with all the rights of inheritance of anyone. And not to mention equal spiritual rights too, because uh, Onesimus is also now a blood brother, sharing in the benefit of the blood of Christ. A partner, Paul, was sure, certainly countering what was to them common knowledge that slaves and servants were less than human. And Paul lifted him up. He lifted him up. 
He says, as a matter of fact, that, that he is equal to him, to Paul, in ministry. And tells him, welcome him as you would welcome me. It's really a beautiful letter. Slavery or servanthood was, of course, very degrading and demeaning, but Paul lifts him up as an equal partner in ministry. And he appeals to his Christian love. Twice he says in the passage, it's a little, a little well, anyway, twice he says in the passage, I don't want to force you to do this good thing. I want you to do it out of the kindness of your heart, spontaneous and not forced as we heard read. If he has done any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very own self. I love this. This is a, a, a obvious Paul. Leave it to him to say something like this. I want you to do what's right of your own free will, but then to say, don't forget, you owe me your very life. You better do it, is what he's saying to him. We Christians, even today, we can take some pride that we come from a long history and a long tradition of revolutionary ideas about human equality. Did you know that John Wesley and the early Methodists were also at the forefront of abolition of slavery? Wesley was absolutely disgusted by the practice. He wrote letters after letters that was his way of communicating, condemning slavery. And he also wrote to William Wilberforce directly, encouraging him in the ministry. But this is what he wrote. He said, ever since I heard of it, the slave trade, I felt a perfect detestation of that horrid trade. Therefore, I cannot do but everything in my power to forward the glorious design of your society. And by this time, Wilberforce had, had created this society for abolition. Wesley was 84 when he wrote that letter, probably the last, one of the very last letters that he wrote. As Methodists, we can look to our very own John Wesley for inspiration, for God's understanding of human equality, even today. Unfortunately, more recent history of Methodism in the United States has not always been so exemplary. In reaction to efforts towards integration in the United States in the early 20th century, Southern Methodists created a new denomination called Methodist Episcopal Church South, which would continue to remain for whites only until 1967 with the formation of the United Methodist Church. 1967. Even today, we can see that our churches are formally, informally, not by law, but by practice. Even today, our churches are generally pretty segregated still. So I think about it like this. Slavery itself was invented by irreligious people, not Christians. It was invented by irreligious people and abolished by devoutly Christian people proud about that. But in between, it was taken advantage of by both all of us. So, now that we have a better understanding of the scripture that's before us, this letter, in light of it, what can we do? How can we respond today? The issue of equality or civil rights is still important. And this issue between uh, the uh, equality between blacks and whites has, uh, has been a long-standing interest of mine. It started in college. I was fortunate enough to spend a couple of semesters in, 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 uh, uh, at the Temple University campus in inner city Philadelphia. One month I stayed, I did a homestay with a black family, and one month I did a homestay with a Puerto Rican family. I have to admit, it was a long time ago, but at that time, the only reason I took that particular assignment in Philadelphia was because I didn't have the money to do the more uh, exciting uh, situations. Like my wife went to Belize, and if I had a little more money, I could have done the same thing. But once I was there, 
I began what would become a lifelong interest in the topic of ethnic diversity. But I, what I realized after doing all this reading and study and research on the topic of civil rights is that reading about a social issue is fine, but there's a lot more. It's not the same as engaging in action. Intellectual understanding is important, but social action is, is even more important. Uh, one of the many books that I read is this one. I wanted to present it to you because this was pr uh, published by Abington Press, that's a United Methodist publisher. And it's a series of letters, uh, articles written by uh, folks from, from the United Methodist Church talking about their experience. It's called, I'm Black, I'm Christian, I'm Methodist. And let me just read this one reflection. In the season after the killing of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery, many white people throughout the United States began to read books on how to be anti-racist. Well, I did it earlier than that, but still, it's me. For white people to actually be anti-racist, though, it must become more of a practice than a state of being. And that kind of hit me hard as I was reading this, that it's true. It has to be more of a practice than just something that I think about. I realized that in many ways it was describing me. The point of is that racism is, is human nature. And in order to avoid it, we have to be actively fighting against it in word, in spirit, and in action. My best practice for you today, that sermon imperative, the thing that I'd like you to take with you, even if you uh, forget all the rest of it, my sermon imperative today, the best practice is this. Activate your inner sense of justice, however deep you have to go. Activate it, and then let's get busy together promoting biblical equality in our families, in our communities, in our workplaces, and in our churches. There are various activities that we can do uh, in this regard. Of course, there's nothing wrong with reading a book like this or a hundred others. I have many of them if you'd like to read on the topic. But there's other ways that we can do this as well. More active ways, maybe better ways, that we can become active promoting equality in our very own church. You know that there are various opportunities for volunteering here uh, at Otterbein Church, but also at uh, Christ Church in Chickensburg. I was at their breakfast yesterday, and it was a moment of equality, really. We were sitting together, we were eating breakfast, we were chatting, we were talking together with the, with the folks of the community. It was a really beautiful moment, and I'm glad I, I started to get involved. That's open for us here, too. For us, it's our sister church. And, of course, we have ministries here, too, at Otterbein. The Corn Ministry counts, and it's active most of, of the year. And we'll start again next year. For your participation, showing that all human beings are equal and uh, have a right to healthy food and sustenance. And I attended a lecture by a prominent member of the black community in Harrisburg that and she encouraged us to promote equality in our households and our workplaces. She said that was the best thing that we could do. People had asked her, what can I do, what can I do? And she said that it's all about your family relationships, conversations with your friends, with your family, your coworkers represent uh, our greatest opportunity to defeat racism and promote equality in, our, in the environment to which God has placed us. Again, activate your inner sense of justice, and then let's get busy together promoting Quality in our families and in our communities and in our churches and workplaces. We Christians indeed can be proud. We come from a long tradition of revolutionary and wonderful ideas about human equality and revolution against racism. Let's not let that go by the wayside. Let's stay active in that regard. The good news is this. 
Equality goes both ways. Not only are we human beings equal in, in value and dignity and worth, but we're also equal in our debt to Jesus for setting us free from slavery. Slavery from sin to sin and death. Regardless of our social standing, regardless of our creed or color, grace really is, grace really is the great equalizer. We human beings are equal in value and equal in debt. But we've been effectively set free from sin and death. Paul said, we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. How silly it would be for us to return to servanthood. Instead, let us rejoice in our Christian freedom and then burden ourselves till we see that everyone can do the same. Let us pray. <clears throat> Gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are the essence of equality, intermingling among your glorious triunity. Forgive us when we exalt ourselves at the expense of others. Lead us in the ways that lead to new life in Christ. Amen. We're going to sing together number 298, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And I ask, if you're willing and able, would you please rise?
Gracious God, we come before you now with these folks on our minds. We name them out before you here. We pray, God, for your healing power to come upon them and us. And in the meantime, we pray for faith to trust that all things are under your control, that life and death are yours, and that we would have the faith and the trust and the hope that in your hands, these loved ones have the greatest care. For those moments where we doubt as we wonder what's taking so long for the healing for which we pray. We take a moment to lift those folks out to you. And we pray for your patience to come upon us as we wait for your good work to be done in our lives and in the lives and the bodies of of our friends and family members. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, I'd like to ask the ushers to come forward for this morning's offering. <laughs>
desire to come down the center. They receive the bread first and the cup. And then you can free to go to either side to either kneel or to stand to receive the elements in your own time at the altar. Say your prayer and then return to your seats by the outside. There's, there's a waste basket from either side that you can make use of as you are moving back to your seats. Our communion service still does start on page 12. You see it above. And then we will conclude with offering Betty the communion and letting her know that, that the time is. People of God, would you please come at your pleasure to receive the elements?